Good evening and welcome. We're so happy that you are here at the College Hill Church of Christ. Welcome to uh, all of those who are worshiping with us via our live stream this evening. Uh, what a beautiful day we've had and what a beautiful day it is to be together uh, and worship the Lord and spend some time with one another. So we're very glad that you're here and glad that you're able to, to spend this time with us. I want to tell you a little bit about our classes for this evening, and we do have one small change to make to this slide that we have up here. Um, we are, of course, having our devotional here in the auditorium, so uh, that will be over live stream and for all of you gathered here. Uh, Colby Wallace is continuing to teach the youth class down in the youth room for 6th through 12th graders. Uh, and we do have a 4th and 5th grade class. Now, the one thing that needs to be changed for tonight is that 4th and 5th graders are meeting in the fellowship hall. So uh, if that affects anybody here in this room or if we see anybody come in later, fellowship hall is where the fourth and fifth graders are going to be for this evening. And I do want to remind you as well that we announced on Sunday that on Sunday, February, or it's March now, Sunday, March 14th, uh, we're going to begin having our Sunday a.m. Bible classes for all ages, uh, children, uh, individual classes for the children's ages, youth group class, adult class here in the auditorium, as well as our Spanish-speaking class as well. So we'll look forward to that on March 14th. As we get into our time of worship, let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy God, our Father, we are so thankful to be gathered tonight as a family uh, who believes in Jesus Christ uh, as people who have uh, a desire in our lives to seek you and know more about you, it is such a blessing to be with other people who, who share that with us in whatever stage we may be in in our journeys of faith, that we can all be united together tonight in this pursuit of knowing you more and following you more closely. We thank you for every person who's participating in that tonight. Uh, including and especially those who are with us online this evening and who are doing uh, the difficult work of staying invested even from a distance. And we thank them and we thank you for, their, for the fact that you are continuing to work in their lives. Lord, we pray that as we open up your word tonight that we would be challenged and inspired to uh, live lives that bring glory to you and that show the world what a difference your love can make. And we pray that you would bring healing and peace to our world, uh, healing both to our physical needs, uh, of which there are many, uh, and we pray that you'd bring healing through the vaccinations that are taking place, and, and also healing to the, the many other hurts that uh, we know that our church and the world are experiencing right now. We pray that you bring peace into our lives and order uh, as, we, um, as we seek to be a light in this world. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. In Christ that we pray, amen. Good evening. Over all the earth we reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again over every thought? Over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, you are the Lord of 
one, Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down and we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were King of the heavens before there was time, and King of all kings you will be. We bow down, and we crown you the King. We bow down, and we crown you the King. We bow down, and we crown you the King. King of all kings you will be. As you know, we're in the process of looking for a new youth minister, so hopefully you have been keeping that in your prayers, and we're going to pray specifically for that tonight. So let's go to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful day and the chance that we have to uh, pause in the middle of the week and spend some time in worship to you and help us to honor you in that time. Lord, we ask that you be with us in our search process for a new youth minister here at College Hill. We thank you for the time that Justin and Deanna have been with us and the great impact they've made in the lives of our young people. But we need to find someone else now, Lord. We just ask that you please guide us through this process, give the people that are in the, involved in the search wisdom, and uh, just be ready to have their hearts and minds open to what your will is for this person and guide us to just the right man who can uh, have a great influence on the lives of our young people here at College Hill and someone that can fit in with our group, with our other ministers, with our families, and just be a great addition to our congregation. Please lead us to that person. Lord, as we're going to be <coughs> reading in a moment, help us to realize that our faith is going to be shown by what we do, that um, just, just saying that we love you is not enough, that we need to be demonstrating it each and every day. And we need to be reaching out to the people around us, making a, lot, a difference in the lives of the people that we come in contact with. Help us to show the kind of love for others that Jesus did. Help us to realize that we have what they need, which is a faith in your Son. We thank you for all the blessings that we have. We thank you for those that we've prayed for that have gotten better. We ask that you be with those that are still struggling with health issues right now. And please just guide us through the the difficulty we're still experiencing as a country right now and help us to be able to get past this as quickly as possible. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture tonight is from James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and, well and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself that it does not have works is dead. But if someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by, by my works. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that holds. 
to do. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning to close of day, in example, in deeds, and in all you say, lay your gifts at his feet, ever strive to keep sweet. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen. So we're going to spend our night, these past few weeks, we've been spending some time either in a passage from James or in a passage inspired by the message of James. And we're going to continue to do that this evening in James chapter 2. First, I want to tell you about this guy. Uh, The author, John Grisham, has some words of advice for aspiring novelists. Are there any John Grisham fans among us? Uh, whether you're a fan or not, I see a couple. Uh, probably most, many people have heard of John Grisham. Like Even if you're not really a, a big book reader, you may be familiar with some of his work. John Grisham uh, actually has this remarkable streak of 28 consecutive books that have come in at number one in America as far as the, uh, the number of sales for the book. And some of those books have been turned into some pretty major motion pictures in the past. Uh, one of them was The Firm with Tom Cruise. You may remember that one. Or uh, uh, The Pelican Brief with Denzel Washington, Julia Roberts, A Time to Kill, Matthew McConaughey, uh, The Runaway Jury with Gene Hackman, Dustin Hoffman. Uh, and also in total... Uh, John Grisham has sold more than 300 million copies of his books. That's kind of hard to fathom. 300 million copies sold of his books. And if that weren't enough, he is also the pride of Jonesboro, Arkansas. You go into the city in Jonesboro, I'm imagining there's a big sign that says, Welcome to Jonesboro, birthplace of John Grisham and Colby Wallace who together have sold more than 300 million copies of their books. So John Grisham's a pretty big deal. Uh, So naturally, if you're a person like John Grisham, a prodigious author like John Grisham, naturally, people are constantly going to be coming up to you and saying, hey, John Grisham, let me tell you about my novel. And when people come up to John Grisham and they want to tell John Grisham about their novel, uh, he has this bit of advice that he likes to share with them. It goes something like this. Don't tell me about your novel. I do not want to hear you talk about your novel. I do not want to hear about how great your novel is going to be. Write your novel. Finish your novel. Show me your novel, and then, then we'll talk about it. Here's his quote. He says, Writers are notorious for spending two years with a great idea and waking up one morning with a pile of papers and they can't finish a story. He says, I wish I had a buck for everybody who has said to me, hey, I'm thinking about writing a novel. Don't tell me about your novel, he says. Just go write the thing. And whatever you may think about John Grisham and his books and even this advice that he gives for aspiring novelist, you have to admit that at least the man lives by his words. From 1991 to 2005, he put out at least one book every single year. 300 million copies sold and counting. John Grisham certainly didn't just talk about being an author. He went out there and showed he was an author by what he did. And I think that it's safe to say that John Grisham and the New Testament writer of the book that we call James, which may have been, by the way, the brother, like the actual brother of Jesus, 
I think it's fair to say that John Grisham and James, whoever he may have been, have something of a kindred spirit. Because for everything that John Grisham has to say to people who talk about writing a novel, James has something similar to say to people who talk about having faith. Here's the quote. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if somebody says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Later he says, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And to that, James says, show me your faith. Show it to me apart from your works if you can. I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, faith without action, faith without works, like, well, it just doesn't work. Put it differently, faith is something to be shown. And I wonder if that speaks to you tonight. I wonder if that is a message that we as a church might need to hear. And if this is something we need to hear, then what is it saying to you? What is it saying to us? Those are the questions I want you to consider as we go to this chapter and we listen. Now, I'm going to share with you a big chunk of this chapter. We're actually going to start all the way back in verse 1, and we won't read the whole thing, but we're going to read a good bit of this chapter. Be thinking about these questions. What is this passage saying to you and me about a faith that is shown? James 2, beginning in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and also a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Skipping down verse 12. Speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment without mercy will be shown to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says they have faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith, by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Well, show me your faith apart from your works. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. And lastly, verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Strong words. Strong words from the book of James. And I wonder, as we read those words together, do you see how... James is hammering home this point to us that faith is something to be shown in the way that we live our lives. Like, not just talked about and, and not just thought about, but something to be shown. Remember how verse 12 said, speak and act. That's James's message. 
And someone will come along and say such and such, but James says, show me. Show me your faith. Faith is something to be shown. And look, as somebody who stands up here and talks about faith quite a lot, that's a challenging message. But maybe it's the kind of message I need, something that can help me. Maybe it's something that can help me to be more like I ought to be and try to be and, and want to be. And, and maybe it's something that can help you too. This message about faith that is shown. So I want to think about that tonight and some of the questions that this passage helps to answer for us. I think that there are actually three questions that we can look at together tonight about this faith that is shown. Three questions that maybe will be helpful to us tonight as we try to live by this passage ourselves. If faith is something to be shown, then how? How is it shown? And if faith is something to be shown, where? Where in our lives can we show it? If faith is something to be shown, why? Why is it so important to have this active faith? So let's start with the first one. If faith, according to James, is something that can and must be shown, like it must be lived, it must be acted out in our lives, then how are we supposed to show it? Out of all the things we could do with our lives, there's so many actions, so many activities, so many ways of living, like which ones are going to make it clear to the world that we are showing, showing that we have faith? Well, I don't think James sets out to give us, like, the list of all of the things that fit into that category. But James does give us one thing, at the very least, that has to be on that list. Showing our faith through acts of mercy. Acts of mercy. Remember verse 13, it said... For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. So let's talk about that for a minute. You know, sometimes when we think about mercy, and uh, there's a writer named Timothy Keller who's done a really good job explaining this. Uh, sometimes when we think about mercy, we think about it maybe more so in abstract terms, uh, like it's something that we do in our hearts, and, and, and that's certainly true. You know, like we may pray to God for mercy, and what we're asking for is his grace and his forgiveness because we've sinned, and we want God to soften his heart toward us. Or maybe if somebody does something wrong against us, we might show mercy to them, and what we're doing is we're forgiving them. We're showing grace toward them, and maybe those aren't the most visible things, but they're real. They're active. It's the activity of our hearts. But you know, the New Testament uses this word mercy in some other ways too. And at other times in Scripture, this word for mercy is used for something else. Not just those things that have to do with forgiveness and grace for sins and shortcomings. Sometimes this word mercy is about helping people. It's about like meeting people's pressing needs. For those of you who were with us last week when we were looking at our passage, we saw this very thing last week. Uh, there was a blind man in our passage named Bartimaeus. It was Mark chapter 10. And you remember he was crying out to Jesus. What did he keep saying? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And what is he asking for when he calls out for mercy from Jesus? In this case, it's not really like, please forgive me, although every person in the world needs forgiveness, but that's not really what he's asking for here, is it? When he calls out, have mercy on me, when he cries out for mercy in this passage, he's asking Jesus to meet this need in his life, this pressing need. And so Jesus turns to him and says, what do you want me to do for you? 
What mercy do you want me to show to you? And the blind man says, I want to see. I need to see. Have mercy on me. Show me mercy. In this situation, it means, help me with this pressing need. Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells this parable about a man who's going down the road from Jericho to Jerusalem and suddenly there are these robbers who come up against him and they beat him and they strip him and they leave him for dead. We call this parable the Good Samaritan parable. And a priest comes along down that same road. He sees the man who's lying there, beaten up and left for dead, passes by on the other side. And then the Levite comes down that road, sees the man lying there, left for dead, passes by on the other side. And then that Samaritan comes And when he sees him there, verse 33, he had compassion. And look at all these things that he does. He went to him. He bound up his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. He sets him on his donkey. He brings him to the inn. He takes care of him. He spends the night. And the next day, he takes out money of his own, and he gives it to the innkeeper. He says, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I'm going to go out of my way to come back here again, and I will pay you for whatever you have spent. Sixteen actions this Good Samaritan makes in this passage. Sixteen things he does for this person who's in need. And what does that make him? It makes him the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. You see how mercy here, it moved him in his heart. But it was also extremely tangible, too. He's doing these things, sometimes simple things, sometimes messy things. But he's meeting this pressing need. And so here in James, we're told judgment without mercy will be shown to the one who has shown no mercy. What I want to know is what kind of mercy are you talking about, James? What kind of mercy do you expect? And the answer, I suppose, is not just the one that moves us in our hearts, but also the one that moves our hands to action. And what good is it to say you have faith but not Take action. Can that faith save? And then look at the example he gives. Suppose there's a brother or sister, and this kind of sounds like that man on the road, poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. This is someone who has some pressing needs. Suppose someone says to them, this sounds kind of like the priest and the Levite, go in peace, be warm and filled. Passes by on the other side. Passes by on the other side. James said, what good was that? More to the point, is faith shown in that? No, for James, faith is shown through acts of mercy. Mercy that meets that pressing need. Mercy that stirs not just the heart, but the hands to action. That's how faith is shown. Which leads us to the next question. We talked about how. Let's talk about where. If faith is shown through acts of mercy that meet these pressing needs, then where is that faith lived out? Where is that mercy demonstrated? You know what James's answer is? Inside and outside. Both inside and outside. The place we call church both inside and outside the walls of the Christian assembly. You know, for some people, if you've studied this passage for years, and I know some of you may have studied this passage for a long, long time, we often think about James chapter 2 as this passage with two teachings in it about two topics. And the first part is about showing partiality, and you shouldn't do that. And then the second part is about having this active faith, and you should do that. I wonder if maybe we might think about it as, One teaching in two places. One teaching about faith in action meeting needs, but happening in two places. 
So the first one is right in the middle of the place where you gather to worship, in the assembly, where all people are to be treated as valuable, regardless of status or background or even if they smell bad. All people are to be shown that faith in action by being treated with dignity, by by being treated as people who are created in God's image, treated as people who matter, treated as people who have a pressing need to belong in God's family and to experience God's love in every way. Faith is shown through action right within the assembly of God's people. But before we're tricked into thinking it just happens here, then there's the next part of the passage. It's not just within the walls of a church building, as if faith and action could be limited to one place in time. Instead, the next teaching shows us that same faith in action out in daily life, out in the world, meeting daily needs with that same dignity, with that same demonstration that people matter, with that same conviction that people are created in the image of God that same recognition that people need to experience God's love in every way imaginable. So for the where question, where is faith shown? It's inside and it's outside, two places, but of course that kind of means all places. It means don't compartmentalize it into like one place or the other, which is the thing that I can be tempted to do. Like you turn on the on switch when you're here and and then you relax when you're not, and it's not that. It's, it's faith that is big enough to reach all those places in our lives. So how do we show faith? We show it through this mercifulness in our actions. Where do we show faith? Both inside and outside. And then that leaves us, of course, to the last question, maybe the most important question. Why? Why is faith to be shown like this? Why does it matter that we live with an active faith in our lives? So as we wrap things up tonight, let's just, let's think about this a little bit together. Why? Why is this so important? Maybe we can even bring back our friend John Grisham to the discussion. You know, John Grisham told those aspiring novelists, those who wanted to talk about the books they were going to write, he'd say, don't talk about that story you're going to write. Show me that story. Do those things and take those steps that are necessary so that this story you think needs to be out there in the world. Like if you have this story you're thinking about writing, you want it out there in the world, right? You want the world to know this story you think's worth knowing. Don't just talk about that. Like do what you need to do so that it is out there. Show me the story, he said. And then he would get really practical with these people he's trying to help. He gave them some advice. He said, write one page every day. No exceptions. If you ever written a page on a computer screen, it's like 200 words. Average John Grisham novel is like 80,000 words. He said, this is what I do. Write one page a day. Nothing's going to happen if you're not writing a page a day. He said, you're fooling yourself if you're not writing a page a day and you want to be a a novelist. What is he saying? He's saying this story you want to tell is so great. You can't do this work in a day. It's too much for one day's work to do it all. People are not going to know the story unless you show it. So show the story. Do what it takes. And I wonder if that's not what James is telling us also. That faith in action is how we do that work that shows the story to the world. James 
2 verse 1 addresses the people that he's writing to as people who are holding the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Verse 7 says, these are people who have been called to wear an honorable name hidden. These are people, and we are people, with a story that we want to be out there, with a story that we want to be known in the world, with the story that we want to carry forward with every new generation and to every place on the earth. And that's too great a thing to accomplish in a day. And yet the world is waiting. And people with pressing needs are waiting. Waiting for more than just talk about the faith that we talk about. They're waiting for us to show them the story. Lived in action. Day by day doing what it takes here in this room but also throughout our lives because where faith is shown in action this is the very last thing the world sees that the gospel is alive when faith is in action it's life brings it to life just like our savior's body was brought to life from the tomb and resurrected when faith is put into action, it's a powerful, visible, and living example of the greatness of our God. Well, maybe if you're like me, this is something you need to hear. We just spent half an hour talking about faith. But our challenge is not just to talk about faith. Uh, our challenge, in ways great and small, is to do what we can to Put that faith into action this week. So maybe let's make this our challenge. Let's look for the equivalent of that like one page a day for aspiring novelists. Let's look for that one small way tomorrow that you can put faith into action this week. However small it may be, it is still an important step in helping that story to be shown. And maybe there's somebody here tonight who needs to take a step toward God's grace in your life. You know, the gospel invites us all, though we are in need of mercy in every way, though we ourselves on our own are sinful, the good news of Jesus is that Christ died for our sins and rose again from the grave. And when we obey the gospel, we're baptized in the name of Jesus, raised up from that water, we're washed clean of our sins, given a fresh start given an opportunity to live our faith and show the story to the world. Maybe you need to respond to that tonight. However you may be called or challenged this evening, we offer this moment to reflect and respond while we stand, while we sing. Lord, thank you so much for an opportunity to come together in the middle of the week and spend some time and, and worship and song and, and scripture. Lord, we thank you so much for all the wonderful gifts you've given us. We pray you'll be with those who are sick and can't be here tonight and, and uh, those who might be um, 
serving in, uh, in a foreign field somewhere, helping to protect our land and our country. Lord, thank you so much for all the wonderful blessings you've given us. Help us as we leave this place, not to, not to leave a story unwritten, but to, to allow you to flow through us and help to write the story of our lives for others to see you living in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.